In this, the second session of my course in accounting, I'd like to talk about income statements. And before we delve into the details of income statements, there's a broader process that I want to talk about. There are two ways you can record income. One is through what's called accrual accounting. The other is through what's called cash accounting. Let's take the easier half of this first. In cash accounting, here's what you do. You record revenues as you get paid. You record expenses as you pay them. I call it checkbook accounting. And if you have a really small business, you might be allowed to get away with this. Cash in, cash out. But in most businesses, you have to use accrual accounting. What is what does accrual accounting require you to do? It requires you to record transactions as they happen. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you as a business sell something on December 30th. Let's say you have a calendar year end. You haven't been paid yet, but you've sold the item. You have to record the revenues of what you've sold in that year's financials, even though you haven't been paid yet. And you then have to record expenses associated with those transactions, even if you haven't paid for them yet or you paid for them last year. In effect, accrual accounting records you, requires you to record transactions as they happen, not cash inflows and cash outflows. We'll come back and talk about the issues this creates for, the, for us in finance because we use accrual income statements. But let's take a closer look at the way accountants think about expenses. Broadly speaking, accountants classify expenses into operating expenses, financing expenses, and capital expenses. Operating expenses are expenses associated with the revenues you generate this year. Labor, material, easy ones, right? But there are other expenses. You might say these are expenses associated with the revenues I create this year. Those are your operating expenses. Financing expenses are expenses associated with the use of any capital that's not equity. Most often, this is a bank loan or debt you've taken on, pre interest expenses. And then you've got capital expenses. Capital expenses are expenses and items that create benefits over many years. Easy example, you're a manufacturing company, you build a factory. The factory is expected to generate revenues this year, but over many years. Equipment that lasts many years is a capital expense. So operating expense or expenses associated with creating revenues only this year. Financing expense or expenses associated with the use of any non-equity capital. And capital expense or expenses that create benefits over many years. And in accounting sphere, each has its place. In fact, let's see how each of these expenses play out. Operating expenses show up just below the revenue line item in an income statement. You subtract them out to get to operating income. Capital expenses don't show up as expenses the year that you make them. They show up on the balance sheet as an asset, but they get written off over the lifetime of the asset in the form of depreciation or amortization, which shows up as an operating expense. Financing expenses show up below the operating income line. So after you've subtracted out your operating expenses and the depreciation portion of your capital expenses to get to operating income, you subtract out financing expenses to get to taxable income. You then pay taxes to get to net income. At least, as you see, you can see expenses play out in different parts of the income state, different part of the financial statements. And at least if you follow first principles, it does make sense. So let's break down income statements and go through these items and at least talk about the broad principles that govern how we think about each item. Every income statement starts with revenues. Should be easy, right? We'll see there are some companies where it can be problematic. Then you subtract out cost of goods sold. These are the expenses directly associated with producing the products or service you sell to get to gross profit. Then you subtract out other operating expenses selling expenses, marketing expenses, GNA expenses to get to operating profit. From operating profit, you subtract out financing expenses, primarily interest expenses, you get to taxable income. Then you pay taxes, you get to net income. Simple, right? Let's start at the top. Let's talk about revenues. Now, as I said, in accrual accounting, you record revenues as you transact. So as you sell something, even though you haven't been paid, you show it as revenues. And most companies, when you sell a product or service, you record the revenues when you sell them, you're done. But what if you're a software company and you sell me a product 
for a three-year contract. In other words, I pay up front for the next three years to get use of your software for the next three years. Do you see the problem you're going to face? You, if you show the entire amount as revenues this year, it's not quite fair because these are revenues for the next three years. So over the last few years, accounting has become much more sophisticated about dealing with products and services where your revenue covers services you have to provide over many years. In fact, the new rules require that you try to show the portion of your revenues that are attributable to this year and then take the rest and show them as deferred revenues in future years. So for many companies, revenue recognition is simple, but for some companies, it can be tricky. And if you keep going in a financial statement in the footnotes, increasingly companies are required to tell you more about the revenues. In what ways? As companies enter into multiple businesses and multiple geographies, they have to tell you where they get the revenues. In fact, most companies, if you keep digging through the footnotes, will tell you where in the world they, re they get the revenues, a geographical breakdown. Now, as we will see when we look at individual companies, that geographical breakdown might not be as detailed and as, um, as comprehensive as you'd like it to be, but you have to take what you're given. So many U.S. companies, for instance, might report that they get 75% of the revenues in the U.S., 25% of the rest of the world. And you might say the rest of the world is a really big place, but it is what it is. But companies have become better at breaking down the revenues geographically. And if you're in multiple businesses, companies generally will also break down revenues by business segment. Again, the way they break down business segments might not be the way you want them to break it down, but it's the way they think about the businesses. So if they look at a company like Disney, it breaks its revenues down into theme parks and broadcasting and movies and other businesses, and it reflects the fact that they're in multiple businesses. So revenues get recognized when you record them, but if it's for multiple years, you've got to try to spread it out over those years. Let's move on to cost of goods sold and other operating expenses. As I said, cost of goods sold are, are expenses associated with, with producing the product or service you're selling. Other operating expenses are expenses associated with operation, but there's no direct connect to actually the product or service. I'll give you a simple example. One of the companies we're going to look at in the example portion of this session is Coca-Cola. The cost of the syrup and to the extent that they own bottling points, the cost of manufacturing the bottles becomes cost of goods sold for Coca-Cola. But selling expenses, advertising expenses, the expenses associated with operations are really not cost of goods sold. They'll show up below the cost of goods sold line. Cost of goods sold gets netted out from revenues to get to gross profit. Other operating expenses get netted out from cost of goods sold to get to operating income. Now, one item you're going to see as you start looking at companies is a consolidated item called SGNA. What does that capture? Pretty much everything but the kitchen sink. Selling general and administrative costs becomes this lump haul that companies use to put expenses that are related to operations that you can't trace to individual products or services. So operating expenses, you've got cost of goods sold, you've got other operating expenses. Now, one of the items that will show up as part of the operating expenses is the capital expenditures you're writing off over time in the form of depreciation. Now, when we talk about depreciation, it's worth remembering that there are three ways in which you can think about depreciation. The first is economic depreciation, which is if you take a piece of equipment and you use it, it becomes less useful the more you use it, the ages. Economic depreciation is supposed to capture the aging of your asset. You can forget about economic depreciation now because in financial statements, what you get is accounting depreciation. How is accounting depreciation calculated? Like much of accounting based on a set of rules. I'll give you an example. One form of accounting depreciation is called straight line depreciation. What is it required to do? You buy an asset that you tell me has a life of 10 years. You write off one tenth of that asset value every year over the next 10 years. You think that makes no sense. Accounting depreciation is mechanical, it's more rule driven, and there are a whole host of depreciation rules that are purely accounting rules. There's a third form of depreciation, just to make life even more messy. It's tax depreciation. We're going to see as we get into finance that the reason depreciation matters is it saves you taxes. 
So the objective in tax depreciation is to not capture the true loss in value, economic depreciation, or even follow the rules as an accounting depreciation. It's to minimize taxes paid. And as we will see, with many U.S. companies, the depreciation you see reported in the income statement in your annual report might not measure up or be the same as the depreciation you see in the tax statements. So economic depreciation, accounting depreciation, tax depreciation. And financing expenses, the most common financing expenses, of course, interest expense on debt, which can take the form of interest either on a bank loan or coupons on a corporate bond. Increasingly, though, accountants have learned that there are items that should be classified as debt that don't show up in the form of bank loans and corporate bonds. When we get to the balance sheet section, I'm talking, going to talk a little bit about leases. When a retail store signs a 10-year lease, I'm going to argue that that contractual commitment to make lease payments is really very much like debt, and accountants have also come around to that point of view. And what that does mean is sometimes once you convert those lease commitments into debt, you've got to compute the interest expense you'd have had on that debt, even though it might not have been called an interest expense. So interest expenses can be explicit on bank loans and corporate bonds. It can be implicit on items that accountants have converted into debt. In some companies, it's worth noting that interest expenses are sometimes netted out against interest income that the company might earn on its cash and marketable securities and reported as a net item. Now remember, if you have a lot of cash and very little debt, that net interest expense can become a negative number. In other words, your interest income exceeds expense. So if you're in an income statement, you see net interest expense and you see a negative item, it's probably because the interest income exceeds the interest expense. Now, once you've got the interest expense out of the way, there's one more cleaning up operation to do. So you've got to operating income, you've subtracted our interest expense. If your company has non-operating assets, the income from those non-operating assets will show up below the operating income line. Let's start with the easy one. Many companies have millions, billions of dollars in cash that they hold. Now that cash is not held as currency, it's invested in marketable securities, usually liquid and close to riskless, T-bills, commercial paper, and it's earning income. That income will show up below the operating income line. That's the easy one. If you made investments in other companies, the way the income from those investments will show up will depend on the magnitude of your holding. Let me be explicit. If you own three, four, five percent of another company, it's called a minority holding. The income from that holding will be recorded as part of the income in your income statement, but below the operating income line. In other words, you show the five percent of the net income or net loss of that company as part of your income statement. That's if you hold a small portion. If you own 55 or 60 percent of another company, you have what's called a majority holding. And accounting requires you to consolidate. Now, this is a very messy process, so hang in there. Here's what accountants ask you to do. They ask you to act like you own the entire company. You think that makes no sense. Okay. you got to hang in there. You have to count 100% of that subsidiaries or that of that other company's revenues as your own, operating income as your own. And then you got to record the portion of the company that doesn't belong to you in the balance sheet. We'll come back and talk about how it's recorded. But if you own more than 50%, a majority stake in a company you have to consolidate. Which brings us to one final cleanup item. Many income statements, you see a line item for extraordinary income or expenses. What this term implies is these are one-time income or expenses. You don't expect them to continue, so you're going to separate them from everything else to help investors out. So examples of extraordinary items would be one-time expenses from say or ga one-time gains or losses from selling assets, a one-time lawsuit charge that you got to pay out, write-offs or charges associated with mistakes made in the past, things you believe are truly one-time. Let's face it though, if you truly have an extraordinary item, it has to show up only once in a while. Stating the obvious. But if you see a company claiming that an item is extraordinary and it shows up year after year after year, you've got to be a little skeptical. We'll talk about what to do with those companies. But truly extraordinary items are separated out because they won't repeat themselves. One final point about income statements. Increasingly in the last few years, companies have turned to, in addition to reporting an income statement, reporting what's called a pro forma income statement. 
What do they do there? They break the accounting rules and sometimes they do it for good reasons. They do it because they believe that the accounting is not treating an expense consistently. I'll give you an example. If you're a company like Netflix, you could argue that what you spend on acquiring subscribers should really not be treated as an operating expense because those subscribers stay on for multiple years. So you might say, look, customer acquisition costs or a portion of it should not be treated as an operating expense. So some of the adjustments are really for good reasons and some are driven by a more trivial reason. You want to make your losses look like profits. You're going to keep adding things back till you get there. As investors, you shouldn't completely dismiss performance statements, but you should verify. In other words, when you see expenses move from operating to capital or operating to financial, you got to pass it through the test. It does that make sense. And when you see expenses removed because the company claims that they're extraordinary, it's your job and my job to make sure they're truly extraordinary. So here's the bottom line. The end game in an income statement is report how much your company made, but viewed through the eyes of accountants as earnings. Those earnings can be reported as gross income, operating income or net income. Each has a place to play, as we will see when we get to the ratios, but each sends a different message about the company. I hope you found the session useful and we'll try this out on real companies in the follow-up session. Thank you very much for listening.